Dr. Jim Gage is an orthopedic surgeon who served as president of the Academy in 1991. When he became director of the cerebral palsy service at Newington Children's Hospital in 1978, he surveyed both therapists and parents of patients and discovered that most were very unhappy about surgical treatment outcomes. Consequently, Dr. Gage devoted himself to finding a better way. His work in gait analysis and the development of gait laboratories have been instrumental in improving assessment, treatment decision-making, and surgical outcomes for individuals with cerebral palsy worldwide. His unassuming and collaborative nature and commitment to excellent patient outcomes helped set the highest standard for care of those with cerebral palsy. You've told me a little bit about you know what you what you first learned when you went into when you went into that business of treating cerebral palsy and and the what the parents were saying to you and the families were saying to you. Well, I mean, the first thing I looked at was the size of the service, and I noticed that over many years it hadn't grown, and about the same number were entering every year as leaving. And so, I set about interviewing parents, and in general, I found that they were rather unhappy with the treatment that their expectations were far above what they were seeing. Um, and so next I started interviewing the therapists and some of them told me quite frankly that they saw their chief job as keeping the patients away from surgery. Uh, and which I guess is a good goal, uh, but at any rate. So, and it became apparent that you, you take a child, they, with spastic diplegia, for example, and they'd, they'd walk similarly and you'd examine them and they'd examine similarly and you'd do sort of the same surgeries on two when one would be better and one would be worse. And I kind of decided it was like trying to do cardiac surgery with a stethoscope, you know, not having any more advanced treatment than that. Yeah. So then I went up and I asked Dr. Kramer if I could go visit the West Coast Gate Labs because Gene Black and Stanford was uh, supposedly doing re uh, gate analysis, although his lab was never up and running the many times I visited. And uh, Jackie Perry was doing, had an EMG video lab, which was very active, but she didn't have anything that really resembled motion analysis. And she was in Downey, California, which is just south of Los Angeles. And then David Sutherland down in San Diego had an operational gate lab, but the problem is you have 22 markers on these kids. You can see about 12 of them on any view. You have to have three views, front, right, right, and left. You have to have three seconds of each view. And those all markers all have to be digitized. And uh, the, frame, the, the frames are running at about 30 frames per second. Uh, so if you start doing the math, there's about 10,000 markers that have to be entered into the computer. And they were entering them manually. They had college students and they had an X, Y plotter on the computer. So the Y axis and the X axis, uh, uh, and you had a device with a crosshairs on it and you had to cover the marker and press a button. And that put the marker into the computer. And so it took three seconds to do a walk and they had to have at least three walks. And the long and the short of it, it wasn't clinically applicable. And then they, they had them to somehow tie that together to the EMG and the uh, force plates. They weren't sort of intrinsically bound together with the program. So, but you know, what he could see and what he, uh, about a child, once he got all this was far above what we could do. Yeah. So then I went back and Bob Kramer had recently taken over from Dr. Curtis who had retired. And, and I said, well, I said, I think we have to have a gate laboratory if we're going to really do cerebral palsy well. And there was no commercial lab available until 1991, 10 years later. So, you know, I didn't really know what I was doing at the beginning, but uh, I read a lot of the works on normal gate, Vern Inman in 1947 uh, when all the amputees were coming back after World War II had been given a, he was at Stanford, had been given a big grant to uh, analyze human gait and try to devise better prosthetic devices. And so he had done the studies, marvelous studies. He'd actually gotten medical student volunteers and 
drilled pins into their balls. Oh, wow. Uh, and so that he could track uh, yeah. the rotations and so on. So, yeah. and he had just published a book that year uh, called Human Walking. So I devoured that book. I had read it about three times. Wow. And uh, we just started from there. And then for 10 years, we kind of picked low hanging fruit. Mm-hmm. And then in 1991, I finally finished a little book that was sort of a manual for for CP gate analysts, you know, that was what I'd learned in 10 years. It was only yeah. 125 pages long, yeah. published yeah. by McKeith Press. And uh, at any rate, that, and then, you know, in the middle of that period, I started trying to figure out how we could get labs commercialized because everybody would come and they'd want gate labs. We did, Steve Coop uh, was my fellow in 1980. 86, I guess. And uh, he was from the Twin Cities and the Gate Lab was running by them uh, and had been for several years. So when he went back to Gillette Children's Hospital, he wanted to have a gate analysis laboratory. And so he put heavy pressure on me and I put heavy pressure on the administration. And by that time, we had several members of of, uh, United Technologies on our board of directors. And so they finally got arm twisted enough that they offered to build a second gate lab at Gillette, uh, but they said they would build it at their cost. There was no yeah. giveaways. And so uh, they did their own fundraising here and opened the lab in 1987, which was six years after ours. Um, and then we updated our lab to current from 81 to 87 standards, mm-hmm. which was a big leap in computer uh, processing and so on. Right. Um, so that's how it all came to be. But there still were no commercial labs. And so mm-hmm. from sort of 86, 87 on, I was trying to figure out how to do that. Yeah. What would you say were the most biggest highlights of your career over this time? Well, I mean, I think we just were picking a lot of low hanging fruit and figuring yeah. out what really was going on. Yeah. And if you're going to treat a child with cerebral palsy, it's a lot like it's a lot like solving a math problem. I mean, you've got primary problems which are coming out of the brain. Now, you, these children are born with normal uh, musculoskeletal systems. It's just that uh, the control system has got some disruption to it. Right. And there was the areas that are damaged are different than all of these children. I mean, maybe they're similar, but they're, they're enough different that you, that, that you can't cookbook it. You have to sort of think, okay, what are the primary problems that are coming from the brain doing to normal locomotion? And then you end up with a list of things that they're doing. And then you look at that list and you sort of say, well, this is solvable, this is not. And and you uh, kind of try, again, I sort of solve it like a math problem. And I I think my major problem with orthopedics, uh, pediatric orthopedics then and, and today, is a lot of them tend to cookbook uh, yeah. uh, their solutions, you know, C, A, do B, because their professors taught them to do B. And, and there's a line from HMS Pinafore, you know, where the captain is singing, I, I always voted at my party's call and I not, never thought of thinking of it for myself at all. I thought so little they rewarded me by making me the ruler of the Queen's Navy. And it's sort of that. Yeah. And so I think that, uh, there's a lot of resistance. There's still resistance to treating children this way. Um, but I think, you know, we've won some real disciples. Uh, and, you know, I could list a handful of them. And most of those are the ones that attend the American Academy of Cerebral Palsy yeah. and Development yeah. Medicine. And uh, Gate Labs are, are now commercially available and springing up. And so that's, I think, what my contribution has been. Yeah. It's been a huge tool for people, you know, it it gives them the ability to really look at the individual movements and, and determine, you know, what is causing this or that and, and the impacts and, and I, as a, as a parent have been able to skim your book and your little, your little book, um, and, you know, and, and see how you can break things down in in ways that you can treat each individual differently and how that, that analysis can really help. I'd like to switch gears for a little bit and talk about your experience with the Academy and, and um, uh, start with um, how you first got involved with the Academy. Uh, well, um, back in 
1978, I think, or 77, um, I now had in, inherited the, I guess it was 78, I now inherited the cerebral palsy service. And as Dr. Kramer said, I didn't know much about cerebral palsy. And so uh, I looked up the American Academy of Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine. And uh, basically, uh, the meeting was on the uh, West Coast that year. I think it was in San Francisco. And, and they had a gate committee. So um, I went early and I kind of crashed the meeting of the gate committee. Jackie Perry was ahead of it and she wasn't real pleased with that, as I recall. Uh, but at any rate, uh, and, and then I went to the meeting and, and then I started joining committees and I joined the academy and that was sort of the beginning. You, you were president of the Academy in, in 1991, and, um, but your, your past president most embarrassing moment actually occurred um, much earlier than that during Dr. Scherzer's tenure as president in 1986. And it's, and it's another story of crashing things, um, which involves Dr. Peacock. And I would love for you to tell the story because it's really yeah, a, a sweet story. Yeah, I guess I tend to crash. crash. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, the torpedo is full speed ahead of me. <laughs> Well, I don't know about 1985 or 19. You know, I think it was probably late in 85. People started running into my clinic at Newington Children's Hospital with this um, issue of the New York Times under their arms, and they all had this article about this <clears throat> neurosurgeon in Los Angeles, and it was an Associated Press article, and it, it sort of, I think, it was overzealously done by the reporter, but it sort of gave you the impression that this person could cure CP. Uh, you know, he could reduce spasticity. And, and, uh, and so it, it really kind of annoyed me. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so I, I called him up and got him on the phone. And I said, do you happen to have published anything that's not in the uh, New York Times? And, and uh, he was, Dr. Peacock was very apologetic and said that, that yes, he published a, a great deal. It was all in the South African Medical Journal, and it turned out that he had fled South Africa at, uh, the, and during the apartheid area as his, as his son came up to be 18 and was about to be drafted because the Peacock family had been very active in the anti-apartheid movement. And they left in the middle of the night with what they could carry. And... Uh, mm -hmm ended up in Los Angeles. I, I think Warwick said he had two or $300 in his pocket by the time he got here. And, uh, but because he had trained uh, in Toronto uh, uh, in neurosurgery, he was able to get privileges here and, and join the staff of, of uh, UCLA and uh, was working there as a neurosurgeon. And since he, then he's become a very good friend. But at any rate, I, we talked on the phone and, and we agreed we'd like to meet each other. And so the American Academy happened to be in Washington, DC and uh, Dr. Scherzer was president of the Academy. And by that time I was getting along pretty well with Jackie Perry and David Sutherland had never been a problem. Uh, and we were giving a, a two day instructional course together. And so we uh, did the first day and then at the end of it, uh, Dr. Peacock walked up and introduced himself and said, do you have a few minutes? I'd like to show you some videos uh, up in my hotel room. And so I went up with him and he showed me these videos with children. And he, you know, we would do the operations, but, and we were doing things like rectus femoris transfer, which is a whole other story. But at any rate, uh, uh, but, you know, they still had the spasticity. They were still stiff. But all of a sudden Warwick was showing me pictures of kids who weren't stiff. I mean, they still had their orthopedic problems. I mean, you know, the, the blending is, is a secret, I think, in many kids. And, uh, uh, but anyway, I was extremely impressed. And so I went down and found Dr. Perry and Dr. Sutherland, told them, and we all went up to the hotel room and we looked at this and we got quite enthusiastic. And we said, uh, you know, we can make about 20 minutes for you tomorrow on the instructional course if you would like to come and and show this, and he agreed. And uh, so we did, and uh, obviously it wasn't peer reviewed. And uh, Dr. Scherzer was 
very, very angry. Uh, <laughs> mad as a hornet, as a matter of fact. That was sort of the beginning of selective dorsal rhizotomy. But then I invited Dr. Peacock to be a guest at my home for a week, and he came and he stayed. And uh, I got our local neurosurgeon that came to Gillette to scrub with him, and we actually modified his procedure a little bit because uh, we put the ele posterior elements back, which wasn't he wasn't mm -hmm. doing, which I think helped to get away from the alertosis and some of the problems. And uh, <clears throat> so anyway, that was sort of the beginning of a, a fellowship, which goes on to this day. I mean, he has a home in, Cal in Los Angeles still, but he also has now a home in Minnetonka, about 25 miles from here, yeah. because his grandchildren, two of his grandchildren are up here, three, I guess wow. now. He drops in once in a while and we see each other. That's really neat. So Dr. Peacock became one of your dear friends because of the Academy and sounds like Jackie Perry has become one of your dear friends and Dr. Sutherland and who yeah, else? They both passed, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Who else have been, have been some of your cherished friends and colleagues from the Academy? Oh, there are lots of them. I mean, Bill Bunnell was a good friend. Um, people that came later, Hank Chambers is a good yeah. friend. Tom Novacek, who was the first person, uh, that we hired, I, we had hired him as our fellow at Newington Children's Hospital, uh, but I never got to help train him because uh, I, I left when he walked in the door, oh. but we hired him as soon as he finished because he had come from Wisconsin. Yeah. Uh, see, he's a dear friend. Sarah Winner is marvelous. Uh, Bob Winner, who I referred to earlier, was, is Sarah's father, mm -hmm. and uh, Bob is passed, but he was always proud of his accomplishments. And everybody was a little afraid of Dr. Winter. I mean, he was a little fearsome. He didn't want to on the other side. But I always used to kid him that, that uh, he was the lesser of the two winners. Uh, because uh, Sarah worked for us as a developmental pediatrician for, for uh, a couple of years until she took a job elsewhere out of town. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was just marvelous. She could do anything she could do intensive care she could do yeah. you know, pediatrics and, and just you know i i never saw her not smiling and happy she's just a wonderful person so uh that's another but there are many many how do you want to be remembered oh i i guess i'd be like to be remembered for the person that uh tried to make pediatric orthopedics things more like uh, like bio bioengineers rather than cooks you know i i I said, you know, I think if you're going to be a surgical, uh, a cerebral palsy surgeon, I mean, you can be a good hip replacement surgeon and pretty much cookbook it and, or knee replacements or whatever you want to do. But I think if you're going to do something as complex as cerebral palsy, number one, you've got to analyze it and lay out your problem list and, and make sure that problem list is pretty accurate. And two, then you've got to go through that list. And as I say, try to optimize a treatment, solving it like a math problem and uh, be open to new, new ways and new techniques. I, you know, in the 10 years that I had that lab uh, without really other people having lab and we were learning, picking the low hanging fruit, I discovered that just about everything I've been taught by my mentors and professors was wrong. So I mean, we, we, we learned things like that and we learned uh, to do gastric immunosuccession and not heel cord like thing. Uh, we learned how to address crouch gait and, and in fact, how to take kids out of crouch gait once they were in it. And, you know, just a host of things like that. And, you know, even if you don't have gait analysis, if you train in an area that has gait analysis, you have a basic understanding of normal gait and you have a basic understanding of pathology. So even with a, with a good iPhone and slow motion video, you can, you can uh, with your knowledge, use that to, to make some better decisions. I mean, gait analysis is the best, but, but when I went to Ecuador annually, we didn't have gait analysis. Uh, and so we do things like that. And I think we still did pretty good treatment. Mm -hmm.